lot of opportunities for, uh, uh, you know, lower rates, and and basically the funding should come from the states. The state, should, you know, the state should be handling uh, the education uh, uh, of our youth. I mean, they we the federal government should not be getting themselves involved in in what really boils down to a local issue. Um, you know, and that's not just college, it's, it's throughout the all 12 years, you know, all 12 years of uh, parochial school too. I mean, it, it's, you know, the federal government continues to put themselves into every aspect of our lives and, and there's always a price to pay for that. Mr. Sarbanes, rebuttal please. Well, on this question of the Fed and oversight of the Fed and scrutiny of the Fed, I was actually a co-sponsor of the bill that was introduced by Ron Paul to audit the Fed. I co-sponsored it before the Dodd-Frank um, financial reform bill was put through. I didn't vote ultimately for Ron Paul's bill because by that time Dodd-Frank had passed and there were significant provisions in there which called for um, oversight and scrutiny of the Fed's activities, which I think um, is appropriate. I, I must say I, I resist this blanket characterization of what I'm interested in as, as government taking over the world. I haven't said that. I've never said that. I think government can be a good partner and should know its place. But if it's a good partner, it can help to spur um, economic activity and work closely with the private sector. Thank you, Mr. Knowles. Well, well I will go on that and I will say that um, I would say that instead of being a good partner, governor should be a good servant to us. That's what it's foremost supposed to be. Um, and, and I know that you sponsored it because I actually, as an impressionable young constituent, delivered the uh, petitions to your office myself. Um, for on the behalf of Dr. Ron Paul, um, and I was happy that you that you that you co-sponsored it, but I was very saddened that you didn't. And and, and your response was um, was a, was actually, I believe, Steny Hoyer's um, response um, almost verbatim. That was uh, something to the effect of that they already have internal audits, and that it's okay, you know, to to let that that that's enough basically to 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 audit them, but the fact of the matter is is that they, they are doing a decidedly terrible job. Our money has become almost worthless, so they're obviously not doing enough. And, and I know there's a fear of politicizing our monetary policy. Well, if there's anything that should be politicized that we should, as a people, should have, you know, direct connection to, it should be our money. We want to hold our applause to the end. Fourth question uh, for Mr. Knowles. Um, as on health care. Obamacare creates health care in the 50 states that look very much like markets or exchanges created while Mitt Romney was governor of Massachusetts. If Romney Care has done a good job of providing access to health insurance, reducing uncompensated care, and generally improving the health outcomes there, why wouldn't we want to have it generalized to all states? Well, first and foremost, as, as congressmen at the federal level, we go in and we swear an oath to the Constitution that you know, it is a, it's supposed to be our guiding light of how we're supposed to conduct our affairs. So if it's not in the Constitution, as much as we want to do it, we can't do it unless we go about the proper channels of actually creating an amendment to the Constitution. And if, you know, 75 percent of the country decides that, it's a, that they want to force that on through, then we, then we get it as an amendment to our Constitution. That's the way it's supposed to be done, not pass a law that's even unconstitutional on the bounds that it was, you know, not, uh, started, th this particular bill started in the Senate as opposed to being started in the House. But aside from the, the um, procedural matters of it, the fact of the matter is that rather, regardless of whether Romney Care worked in Massachusetts well or not, um, it, it, it's not something that every one of the states wants. So we're now binding the states to have to do this, and we're binding individuals even worse. The first time in your in entire history of our government that the federal government is going to force you to buy a product or a service. That's a scary thought, because this is now sets a new precedent for things that it can do. I myself am going to be hit with another tax burden. I believe it's 1%, another 1% on top of the rest of the taxes that I'm done, including the inflation tax and you know, the money that, that I have to spend uh, on a lot of other things in my life, to now to comply with this law. I, I work in an industry that doesn't provide this. So now, every, there's going to be unintended consequences, as Don Edwards brought up in the last time we had a debate up here, she wanted to raise the minimum wage. Well, the unintended consequence of that and the unintended consequence of this is that the price of your food is going to go up inside the restaurant business because your employees are now going to have to flip that bill in order to pay for that. These are the unintended consequences. And if a state doesn't want this, the state should have the right to be able to opt out. 
on the behalf of its people, not force all 50 states to go into the maelstrom together. This is not the way our country is run, and this is, this is a very forceful and, 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 and horrible way of, of you know, getting this type of legislation to come across, regardless of how nice it is, or how, of, of who wants it. I want to give everyone everything, but I don't have the power to do that, even if I'm your congressman. Uh, Mr. Drogas, same question. Uh, well, I don't far, fall too far from uh, Mr. Knowles on this. Um, Hey, you know, Obamacare is, in essence, I mean, we basically think that we can solve the problems by throwing more legislation at it. And um, I, I personally don't believe that that's the way to do it. Uh, basically, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, what we've done is we've created the largest tax in the history of the country. And, and we have no real idea of what the benefits of this, pro of this program is going to be. Uh, we don't know what the outcome, uh, you know, how much it's going to cost the country, how much it's going to cost individuals. W we really have no idea. And, and, you know, the best part about that is apparently neither did Congress when they signed it because uh, they just said, well, sign it and see what happens. So, um, you you know, I, I have a major problem when the government has decided to get into an industry that is one sixth of of the GDP of the country. So, um, you know, I, I just don't think that the government should be, you know, that far reaching, and I don't believe that they should be involved in every aspect of our lives. And uh, it just seems to me that you know the expanding government is continuing to do so. Mr. Sarkins. Thank you. Well, I mean, I supported the Affordable Care Act. I, I don't think anyone here is surprised uh, on that point. But let's think back to what was motivating that. We had runaway premiums that were are, are really crippling for families across the country. We had insurance um, companies and insurance industry that was making decisions that ought to have been made by patients and their doctors. So we wanted to remedy that. One way we, we are restraining these runaway premiums um, is we're requiring that these insurance companies put at least 80 percent of that premium dollar to medical expenses instead of putting it to overhead and executive compensation and things um, of that nature. Uh, we wanted to cover 30 million people in this country, actually it's 47 million people who don't have health care coverage, 60 percent of whom are small business owners or employees of small businesses. So that was one of the uh, principles behind creating these health insurance exchanges to allow small businesses to go into the exchanges, get the benefit of a large insurance pool, and stop paying premiums that are 20 percent more than what large businesses pay for the same exact benefit packages because the large businesses get access to a broader insurance pool. So that was another thing that we tried uh, to do. We wanted to get rid of the free rider problem that exists, where people show up in the emergency rooms of hospitals, which is the highest cost care, that gets shifted to somebody, which is to all the people who have insurance and are already paying uh, high premiums. And we wanted pr to provide some benefits, important ones, like the fact that now young people can stay on their parents' health insurance until age 26. These were the motivations, and I think many of these things can be achieved as we implement the bill uh, going forward, and I'm going to continue to support that implementation. One minute rebuttal on health care, Mr. Knowles. Um, we mentioned that prices were the, the driving force to make uh, this legislation go through. Well, first of all, the free market and competition will drive down prices. This, is, this is, has been proven throughout time that if you have more um, players in the game, that they're going to have to compete over the existing resources, so they're going to drive down the prices in order to take up more that's, that's actually in the market. Um, uh, so things like the pre-existing condition and the young people being able to maintain their parents' insurance, these are conditions that are very enticing for someone to come and buy my product if, if, we have, if I have to fight for your, for your money. But instead, the government has uh, 
very badly use this interstate commerce clause in the Constitution to say that we can control um, the, 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 the control of service and goods across states' lines. So they have not allowed for states to be able, for people in the side states to purchase uh, out of another state. And, and I also want to state that on the interstate commerce clause, that was actually one of uh, my opponent's um, responses to, to the official ruling of the, uh, the, the, the um, Supreme Court that he wished that, it was, that, it, they, that they had thought it would fall under that, that interstate commerce clause. And I think that's very um, irresponsible to, to do. Mr. Drogas. Uh, well, uh, you know, as much as I, uh, I have my issues with the Obamacare um, or the Affordable Care Act, uh, there are a lot of things that, that, came out of, uh, that came out of it that are good. Uh, I do like uh, the ability to have your children on your insurance until you're 26, and I believe that the interstate exchange was a great idea. I also think that if the government got out of the way, that that would be something that would have been able to have been done years ago. Uh, but because of the, uh, y y you know, the the uh, obstacles that were put in the way up until this point, that is why you had the situation that you had. Um, and one interesting thing that uh, Mr. Sarbane said was that it should be a patient and a doctor that makes choices. Um, but from what I understand with the, uh, you know, the elderly care, uh, you now have a, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to use the, the, the regular vernacular, but basically you have a group of people making decisions on what, um, what procedures you can have done and what procedures you can't have done according to cost. Last so. rebuttal statement, Mr. Sarbanes. Sure. Well, first of all, the health insurance exchanges are actually premised on the idea of competition. You're going to have private insurance um, companies going into the health insurance exchanges and offering a um, sort of baseline, well, there's sort of three different tiers of benefit packages that they can offer. And they're going to be competing to offer that in as reasonable a fashion they can because they want to get customers. So you're going to have inside these exchanges the great American experiment of competition going on, and I think that will provide insurance for millions of Americans who right now uh, have no way of accessing it because the pricing is so high and they don't have access to a broad um, insurance pool um, at the same time. So um, this is one of the principles upon which we, we built those exchanges, and I think it can have um, uh, significant benefits um, going forward. And, and, you know, the other thing I do have to mention is that um, the Affordable Care Act um, finds some savings out of Medicare and then puts those back into Medicare to provide some additional benefits to our seniors. Thank you. Um, final question was chosen by my students, and that question is on political discourse. This is a 90-second uh, statement. There will be no rebuttal. My students selected one on political discourse, Anne Arundel Community Colleges, Center for the Study of Local Issues, just concluded a survey of Anne Arundel County residents and found that about 85% favored a presidential candidate who would work well with Congress. If you were to be given a blank slate and given the complete ability to set up a certain set of guidelines for ensuring that members of Congress have to work together and find common ground, what would they be? Mr. Sarbanes first. Well, I guess you would want to um, instill in those members every chance you got a reminder of why they're there and who sent them. Um, you know, being in public office, running for uh, political office, I think uh, demands humility and remembering that uh, you serve your constituents first and foremost. I think, unfortunately, sometimes people get to Washington and maybe they, they lose track of that. I have the blessing, um, as do a few members of Congress, of being able to come home every night, talk to my constituents, um, and hear their concerns. Um, I also think that one way we can address this gridlock is to build relationships across the aisle and with our colleagues. One of the things that's standing in the way of that right now is the tremendous amount of time that people spend on fundraising. By some estimates, the average member of Congress is now spending 30 to 70 percent of their time fundraising, uh, which means you don't have time, frankly, to review the material as carefully as you should, and you don't have time to build those relationships, which really are at the heart of uh, fashioning compromise and building constructive solutions um, across parties. And so if we can address this issue of money in politics in a serious way, I think that will enhance our ability 
uh, to cooperate in Congress. Mr. Noel, same question on political discourse. Um, well, if you give me a perfect scenario that I can somehow make every, you know, 435 people agree on something, let me, let me try to come up with something for that. One, one big thing is the looming debt. Uh, this is a problem that we all face, and if we don't all work together on this, we will all surely drown in it together. Um, one of the things that idealistically I'd like to see is, of, uh, is us upholding our Constitution and maintaining our, rep our republic and the, um, the, the, the sense of that. Um, but that's, once again, you know, something that's not really done in Congress today. But what is done in Congress today, when people do work together, which I'm afraid of right now, is they come up with bad legislation um, that really only benefits government and actually hurts, hurts the individual. Things such as the Patriot Act, that's, that was a you know, pretty bipartisan thing at the time when it first happened. Things such as the National Defense Authorization Act 2012 that came around um, that you know, allows for indefinite detention of our citizens in our society. We have H.R. 347, which is the, the Government Improvement Restricted Buildings and Government Improvement Act that was passed 399 to 3. My opponent voted for it. This is allows or doesn't allow anymore for you to be able to protest in certain restricted areas. Um, actually, there was people be, uh, arrested in the beginning of this month that were cited as arrested because, of, um, because they were praying in front of the White House uh, against the Affordable Care Act. So because of this new bill that was passed, this new law that was passed, they were actually taken out and cited because of this. And then hopefully, well, hope, hopefully they won't come together on another bad piece of legislation like this Grassroots Democracy Act that my opponent is trying to pass through. Uh, Mr. Drogitz, 90 seconds on political discourse. Uh, well, the, the one thing that, uh, that I've heard over and over again from uh, Congressman Sarbanes is that the the individuals in Congress need to build relationships to cross party lines and, um, and, and the reason that they can't do that is because of fundraising uh, for campaigning. And, and I, I have a major problem with this whole, this whole scenario.